did the idea for writing Jesus in the 9 to 5 come about? Well, I am a working professional writer, so I try to look at what the readers really do want. And I noticed that there was a double trend that was going on in publishing during uh, 19, or 2013, 2014. On the one hand, people wanted really good, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge information. They were reading books like Turning Points, and uh, they wanted to see you know, how things were different. And, for example, Free Cannot was a book that really surprised people and showed them. So I thought the Bible had a lot of good, solid information to present. But I also noticed that there was a second trend, that people loved stories. They were buying books like The Prayer of Jabez. They really just liked teaching that came in a story form, that sort of thing. So I thought, why couldn't somebody combine the two to offer some good, solid, nonfiction information, but at the same time offer a good teaching story? So I thought that that's what I would do. I would put together a dozen chapters about what the Bible has to say about pragmatic things, such as time management and financial management and goal setting, things that could really help people from a biblical perspective, things that never get out of date. But then inserted within the book, I thought I would put the storytelling thing. So I created a scenario in which Jesus actually was on the earth in the 21st century running a business, and naturally it's a, it's a furniture business, he's a carpenter, and he's actually using the things that I talk about in the nonfiction chapters so that we get to see him in action, hiring people, training people, disciplining people, encouraging people, running a market, showing honesty and ethics and morals in business. And there's a great deal of entertainment in it because for people who know the Bible, I've used a lot of humor, a lot of wit. And so it combined the two. And what was surprising to me is when the reviews started coming out, the people were enjoying the fiction just as absolutely as much as they did the nonfiction, saying that they were entertained and taught at the same time. So it was a combination of seeing what readers wanted, good storytelling, teaching, but also good hard, cutting-edge facts. And I put the two together in Jesus in the 9 to 5. It really is an incredible story. How did you start writing it? Did you start with your characters, the plot, or a little bit of both? What I did was I tried to do the nonfiction part first and to see that I was on track with the readers. So I usually try to put together a book in sections. I'll come up with an outline, and then I'll say, all right, these are the topics I need to cover. And then as each chapter comes together, I will write it as a major magazine article, and I'll send it out. And if editors like it, and they buy it from me, and they publish it, and then readers give me good feedback, then I'll know for sure that I'm on the right track. So that's how I started with this book. I started putting the nonfiction articles together that they would later formulate into the book. And then I went back and thought, okay... Now, what stories could I show from the Bible that would make this applicable if I told it as a narrative? So, for example, if we're talking about the idea of why do we forgive people when they make mistakes, I um, use the situation of talking about how Jesus dealt with the woman at the well and also the woman who was caught in adultery. But then I created a scenario in my book where a woman is caught stealing in the factory where Jesus runs everything, and they bring her in. And that's what the short story is all about. And then he turns to the other people who are there bringing her and accusing, and he just makes a little note on a notepad, kind of walks around front and says, well, like if somebody clocked in late, that would be theft, right? And the guy standing there is kind of embarrassed because he knows he meets him. And he came up to another one and said, if somebody used a company car for personal business, that would be like theft too. And he goes on down the line, and each one of them realizes that each of them is as much a sinner <laughs> and a thief as this woman is. So then he turns and he says, well, well, who do you think here should be the first one to accuse her? Well, none of them can step forward because they're all guilty too. Well, the reader says, oh, I see what you're doing. You're taking an ancient biblical story and you're showing that it would just work as much applicable in the 21st century as it did back then. I get it. I get it. And that was what my goal was, to show that the Bible is not out of date that you could take the same lessons and applications and put them in time right now. And what Jesus said doesn't need to be altered or updated or changed. It just sent it in a new venue, and people said, oh, I can see now how it's as appropriate today as it was then. And that's my job as a writer, to find out how to show that to people, and I was hoping that I did that. I definitely think you did. And that brings up another question. How did you make Jesus' character so three-dimensional? He seems... He's real to us, but in the book, he really just comes alive. And how did you do that? 
what I did was I thought if I could actually literally be like one of the disciples and sit down and spend some quality one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, which I try to do every morning, but of course this would be amazing if you could physically have him before you. What do I think I would want to ask him? What do I think I would want to learn from him? And how do I think he would respond to my personal needs? And I went back and looked in the Bible and I saw that there were times when I think Jesus had a really great sense of humor. I mean, I've always laughed and thought that when he healed the beggar at the well and uh, made him where he wasn't lame anymore, he could walk, that probably it dawned on that guy a couple of hours later, hey, I'm going to have to go to work now. <laughs> it's kind of funny, that situation. And uh, so many situations, like Jesus used jokes. He used exaggeration. When he was preaching one time, he said, you know, you're worried about the small little speck in somebody's eye when you've got a beam in yours. And, and that's just exaggeration. And that's a form of comedy. So when I tried to create Jesus, I thought, I bet you he had a good sense of humor. I think that he could teach by letting us laugh at ourselves. I think that he would be patient, very, very patient. And I think that, you know, that he'd be understanding, but he'd also be nobody's fool. And so I put those qualities down, and I thought, now, how do I interpret that? And that's what I said about doing in the story, letting him talk in a voice that was in control and in command. He knew what he was doing, what he wanted to teach, but at the same time, empathetic and, and friendly and open and even with a sense of humor. And just like every good story, when I when I read his parts, I can hear him talking and I can picture him saying these things, and it's absolutely amazing. Well, I appreciate that because I read my material out loud, and I try to create situations where the voices sound different. My character of Pete Fishers, who's the counterpart, would be Peter the Fisherman. He's got dirt under his fingernails and wears, you know, a hard steel hat and steel toed shoes. He's the kind of guy who works in a warehouse, rough and tumble and hard, and yet Jesus sees that he has a soft and kind heart and he has potential there. Whereas my Matt Feingold, who's my Matthew character, he's a former IRS agent, three-piece suits, gold rim glasses, hair slicked back and nice and styled and highly educated, that sort of thing. And so when I I read my material out loud, I thought, okay, does this sound like people I've known who are like this? Does this carry their vocabulary, their phraseology? And so that was part of my thing, you know, making that, and then Jesus having a consistent voice of being able to talk to anyone on any level, but also, you know, having this idea of having a distinctive voice of his own where people wanted to listen to what he had to say. And I think even if you're not super familiar with the Bible, all of these things in your story come to life so much that you don't need a huge knowledge of the biblical stories these come from. It certainly helps to get some of the humor that you put in there, but it's still a wonderful story either way. Well, and I think that what I tried to do is I tried to go with that idea that maybe people weren't biblical scholars, but there are a few things that just about everybody in the whole world knows about, and so that could make a humor. For example, uh, I, everybody, I think, whether you've gone to church or not, know the fact that Jesus turned you know, water into wine. Well, one of the jokes that I have early in the book is I have him turn wine into water to help a guy who's a borderline alcoholic. Well, that's a joke that just about anybody could understand particularly. And there are others that are, if you know the Bible, you get even more of a joke out of it and you laugh but if you don't you can follow along because the lessons are going to be there when Jesus taught he used parables he used anecdotes he used stories he used illustrations because all the people could nod and say oh yeah I get that I understand what you mean that's a comparison there and he didn't use heavy theological theory because the average person who's out there listening to him would be a person probably illiterate uh, you know a sheep herder or a carpenter or somebody you know worked with camels or a tradesman or something and they they weren't all Sanhedrin and Pharisees and lawyers and scribes, so he taught by example. So I tried to do the same thing, use stories where people would say, I get your point, I get your point, and that's that's what I think worked in the book. I definitely agree. It worked unbelievably. And the settings in your book, I read your articles in the Christian Communicator, and the past two months it's been about how to make your settings come to life. So how did you apply those articles, for those who haven't read them, how'd you make your settings so vivid and true for our times? Well, fortunately, I've had 
the advantage of being in this business for quite a long time, and I've written a lot of motivational books, books on public relations, financial management. So corporations have hired me to come into their operations to train their executives, train their line workers, train their personnel, train their managers. And so I've had a chance to go into warehouses, into factories, into corporations, into mills, all kinds of situations where I've seen those over the years. I've talked to the people who do the kind of jobs that I'm talking about. I've met with them. I've spent time. And I was able to take those real-life experiences then and describe them and transcribe them to put them into situations, whether it was a boardroom where I've got all the disciples working together on laptops, or if it's a warehouse where they're trying to load in information or send out goods, those kind of things. And it helped to have some real life experience. Whenever I'm doing an, an article or a story or something where I don't have a background, that's the first thing I do. I go out and I talk to the people who are directly involved in it. I try to walk the floor. I try to, you know, pace the ground and see what it's like to really, really be there. So having had these, you know, 20, 25 years of corporate consultations and advising and being a consultant to a lot of um, American businesses, then I've had that ability to draw that in. And that's what I did. I tried to make it very realistic. And I Fortunately, it's clicked because a lot of the reviewers said, oh, yeah, it's just like I'm right there in the factory. It's just like I'm right there in the boardroom. He, he's got it. He's nailed it. So I felt very gratified by that. Well, you definitely should. And there is a sequel to Jesus in the 9 to 5. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, what I'm trying to do is I want to write a three-part series so that we have the beginning, Jesus in the 9 to 5. This is the basic foundational thing of starting the business, recruiting the people, because that's the way the New Testament is. When Jesus has his ministry, he goes out and he calls Matthew, and he calls Peter, and he calls you know Andrew, and he calls the different ones. And so I wanted to do a parallel to that in my book to set that up. And then they set up what they're going to do. And he tells them right from the beginning, I'm going to turn this over to you eventually. I'm not going to continue to run it. I'll be with you about three years or so. And even though they hear that, they don't really want to hear it. They enjoy having him there. But that's the way the first book ends, kind of on a cliffhanger there, because he calls in Peter and Matthew, and they're upset because he's starting to cross-train them, show them how to do each other's job. And at the end, they say, why do I have to learn, if I'm a manager of the warehouse, why do I have to learn accounting? And the accountant says, well, if I'm, you know, accountant, why do I have to go out there and learn how do we ship things and all that? And Jesus says, because I'm going to turn this over to you, and I'm not going to be here forever. And that's kind of the cliffhanger. So then book two picks up where we're going to take that to the next level, and what is Jesus going to be teaching them, and how is he going to work this transition? And then there's a lot of humor in that, too, but they're expanding the operation, and he's putting more responsibility on them holding them far and far more accountable, but they are developing. They're maturing, just like the real disciples did, <clears throat> the more that they spent time with Jesus. And then eventually, yeah, that's what I'm going to call that book, Jesus in All Four Seasons. And the final concluding book will be on Jesus and the Yesterday, Today, and Forever. And that's where I'll have to do a modern-day kind of crucifixion and resurrection, and that's going to have to be a, a really fine line that I walk through so people will say, yes, that's believable, that's realistic, it's contemporary. And I'm still working on the details that but i have finished the sequel and we've got it and we're hoping it'll come out sometime late this year well i can't wait i know i'm gonna be getting a copy for myself <laughs> and stepping away from jesus in the nine to five and going more to a personal angle when did you first feel the calling to write a book well um i was when i was in high school I'd always thought that I wanted to be an attorney because I thought that arguing cases and preparing, you know, lectures in front of an audience of 12 people, a jury, that would be exciting and thrilling. And I enjoyed that kind of interactive thought. But in the 12th grade, I had a teacher in English, honors English, and he opened books to me in a way that no one had ever done before. I just couldn't wait to get to his class each day, and I hated when the bell rang. He's just a phenomenal influence on me. And I went to him when I was halfway through my senior year, and I said, you know, Mr. Ringel, I said, I always thought I wanted to be an attorney. And I said, but if I became the best attorney in the world and rose up to become president of the United States of America, I could only influence people eight years at the most. But if I was a writer, I could influence people for centuries. Well, he chuckled. He said, yeah, if you ever had anything to say. <laughs> he was joking around with me. But at that point, he took me under his wing, and he said, um, let me show you books that you should read. And he edited my essays more. And when I left high school, and I 
determined that I wanted to be a writer. He told me, he said, this is going to be a lonely road because he said there are a lot of English teachers who wish they were writers rather than teaching someone else's writing. So he said, you're going to have to have your head down and stay focused. And he was right, but he encouraged me along the way and I had other teachers too. But once I really got into writing, and I would say I was in college, then I realized that the epitome would be to come out with a book so that I could put it. So one of the ways that I started developing, I wrote the first book was on time management because I needed to learn that myself. And I wrote a whole series of magazine articles that later were combined into that book. And then I realized that that's how I could start focusing my future. Be a magazine writer, be a feature writer, be an interviewer, but save the copyright and ownership of my material and then combine those later. And in nonfiction, that worked pretty well. So I then my first book came out around when I was around 31 and uh, had had a chance to be a writer for about six years. And how many drafts does it usually take you to get from the beginning of the book to actually having the book published? Well, if I'm doing a nonfiction book, that's one of the advantages because if I divide the chapters and I make them individual articles, often when I'll send them out to book uh, or to magazine editors, they would very often come back and say, you know, we really like your article. We want, we think we should change the lead a little bit like this, or could we change the title of this? And they'd offer good advice, and they became like my mentors and my editors, so that by the time that version wound up in the book, it had gone through some revisions. I also had some good editors I worked with. I had the advantage of working at some of the major publishing houses, Bob Smerrill and Thomas Nelson and Tendell House and just the big ones, you know, Harvest House. And just was a great situation of no matter how good of a writer you are, you always need an editor. You always need an editor, somebody who has a second eyes on that. So that helped. So today I would say that I usually do a first draft of something and then I let it sit and get cold. And I'm talking about three, four, five days. And I'll try to pick it up with new eyes and I'll do the own line editing, copy editing of it, and then make sure that I read it out loud, that it sounds right. And then I'll let it sit for a few more days, and I'll finally do a third check of it before I send it out. So usually it goes through about three drafts by me, and then I'm still open if I, uh, if I have an editor who comes back and says, well, here's a suggestion. Just to give you a case in point, a really good one. My father's been deceased now for about seven years, but he was a, he made and fit artificial eyes for a living. And one time I did a big profile piece on him, and I had a very clever title. I called it The Eyes Have It, and I spelled it E-Y-E-S, which was a very good title. But one of my editors suggested even a better title. She said, why don't we take a line from the Bible, an eye for an eye? And I said, oh, mine was good, yours is even better. So sometimes editors can do that for you. They'll just say, you know, as good as yours as maybe I can polish it a bit. So I'm always open. I think it's a fool who says, you know, I, I can't be edited, I can't be, you know, critiqued or anything like that. We never get to the point where we're just perfect. That's so true. And I know I have a great editor for my book, so I don't know. <laughs> and what book was it that made your agent, Chip McGregor, stop and think, hey, I think I like this guy? Well, I'd known Chip for quite a long time. Uh, I used to be my own agent. I used to negotiate all my contracts. But then when the world changed so drastically in the world of publishing about five or six years ago, e-books came in and e-commerce and we had e-online uh, publications and online newspapers and things started changing so much with MP3 downloads and overseas translations and everything was just exploding. You needed a much more sophisticated agent to handle material. And so that's when I talked. I had an agent in New York, Peter Ruby, a really good guy. And he, he did a couple of books. Because there's one thing an author cannot do, and that's hold an auction. And what an agent can do is send out eight or ten copies of your um, proposal, your outline, your sample chapters, and then companies will bid against that. Who's going to get the book? Well, an author can't do that, but an agent can. So I did use a couple of agents, Sandy Gellis Cole one time, and then Peter Ruby. But uh, to have one on a regular basis, no, I just negotiated my contract. Well, then what I realized was getting too complicated. I talked to Chip, and Chip had been a personal friend of mine. I'd worked with him at writers' conferences, and he'd actually taught with me at Taylor University for a year as one of the visiting guest professors when I brought him in, because Chip's a highly educated man. And he looked at the idea, and he said, yeah. He said, uh, this is very different. This is this is unusual. And it was his idea to not make it a one-book standalone, but to develop it into an entire series. So that's the way he pitched it to AMG, and they looked at the idea, and they liked the concept. So he had a lot of belief in it. And I just finished a novel that he's now representing me out. We're trying to sell that. He's got that. So he's a, he's a good encourager, a good friend, and but a sharp guy. He's written books himself, and so he knows what the writing process is all about as well as the marketing. And that's important. And which of your books are you most proud of? 
Well, I think the one that has done the most for me and it made my name for me was a book that came out in 1984 called Positive Workaholism. And it was a surprise to me and everyone else. It was during the Reagan administration where everybody was, let's pull ourselves back up by our own bootstraps and let's get going. And I'd interviewed people who were really uh, counterintuitive to what workaholism was about. They were workaholics, but they, I mean, they were loving it. They could go 12, 14 hours a day at what they did, and it was energizing rather than exhausting. And I realized there were negative workaholics. People just ran and ran and ran all the time, wore themselves out. And then there were positive workaholics, people who were so excited about what they got to do that it didn't even seem like work to them. So that's those are the people I interviewed. What were your secrets? What are your techniques? And then and when I came out with the entire book on that, it just exploded in the scene. The book became a bestseller. Then it became a book on tape, which became very successful. They were selling it in airports and bookstores and everything. And then they even made a one-hour training film out of it, a motion picture, and that was successful too. So years went by, and the book's concepts were good, but the people I interviewed, like Lee Iacocca and uh, Reggie Jackson, and people who were famous celebrities at the time, they weren't known to the younger generation. So in the early 21st century, around 2005, I rewrote the book, keeping the same concepts, but I changed the illustration. I interviewed more modern people, people who are highly recognizable names now, and we changed the name of it to The Power of Positive Productivity. And so it was brought out by uh, Possibility Press this time, and uh, I was really pleased with it. So the concepts were great, just the illustrations need to be updated. So I think I'm really most pleased about that for the fact that it, it made my name for me. It enabled me to be able to quit my job at that time and just become a full-time writer for 16 years. But it also uh, kind of changed the world. People will, will tell me to this day, oh, I read that book and it motivated me. It gave me goals. It gave me a direction in life. It gave me answers to what I wanted to do and made me go into what I really enjoyed doing. So when you when have a hit book, it changes people's lives too. That's always going to make you excited as an author. Well, that's incredible. Now, I know I met you when you were speaking at a writer's conference, but when did you start speaking at these conferences? What happens usually is when you have a blockbuster book, people will start contacting you for radio and TV interviews, and then when they start seeing you there and read your book, they'll want to come in. So I was contacted when, I, when Positive Workaholism was such a blockbuster book. I was contacted first by the University of South Florida, and they asked if I would come down and keynote with their big conference that they have every January and then do some workshops there. Well, I was excited about it. I thought, sure, you know, I'd love to do it. By that time, I was a doctor. I had a degree, in, uh, four degrees in English, and I knew a lot about writing. I'd been a newspaper reporter, too. And so I prepared diligently, and I had three things that I kept in mind. One, I decided that I was going to uh, use some great illustrations because I thought that people really like examples and not so much theory as examples. Second thing, I was going to assume that people didn't know what I was talking about, so I would make it easy by saying point one, point two. 2.3, and they could take notes like that. Notes. And the third thing, that I was going to make it entertaining, that I was going to have some fun, not just blow off some no dust off old notes, you know, and really make it fun for them and make them glad to be back in school. Well, it turned out to be a winning combination. It just went over phenomenally well. In fact, the third day I was at the conference, two newspapers came out and they covered my, my uh, keynote addresses. A TV station came to film me doing it, and that spread the word. And So what happens is when people hear you and they really like you, they will talk back at their writer's club, back in the state where they come from, uh, back in the city where they dwell, and they'll go in and talk to people at other writers' conferences. Oh, you should get so-and-so. Oh, he's really, really great, you know, wonderful. And that's kind of the word of mouth that spreads out. So I started, yeah, about 1984 when I got my first couple of invitations in. And from that point on, it was more like word of mouth. And even today, I do at least, oh, at least 15 conferences a year, either two-day retreats or three- and four-day conferences. And I still enjoy it. I really do. It puts me out in front of the people. As you mentioned, I do a column in Advanced Christian Writer and a column in Christian Communicator. And where I get my ideas are when I'm teaching workshops. I just listen to the questions that people bring up. Well, what about this? What about this? Or I'm doing this. What about this? And I think, okay. And I answer their question, but then I go home and I prepare an entire column on that because I figure there must be a lot of people interested in that. And sure enough, so that keeps me in front of the public, keeps me on the cutting edge of what they're interested in, and helps me do my columns better. And plus, I just enjoy being with writers. Only writers understand writers. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And as an editor and as a professor, you work with a lot of up-and-coming authors. So what do you like most about working with them? 
Well, for me, there are three or four things going on. I direct a professional writing major at Taylor University. And when my 18-year-old and 19-year-old freshmen and sophomores are working, and they start getting checks in the mail, or they start sitting, getting their bylines, and they bring it in, and they see their name in print. For me, it's like that first time all over again. I get to relive it all, because I see the excitement. Like, I'm really a published writer. Wow. It's so exciting, and I'm so happy for them. But there's another factor in it, too, and that is because I teach from a Christian perspective, Many of these students realize that they're not just getting a job, they're getting a ministry. For example, not too long ago this past uh, academic year, I had a young lady come to my office and she was actually trembling. She was holding a piece of paper and trembling. I said, are you all right? She said, yeah. But she said, I've just been shaken to the core. I said, what am I? what's the matter? She said, well, you remember last spring when you had us writing devotions to send out, she said, so that we would put them in the mail. She said, well, it took about six months, but mine was published and put out. And she said, today I got a letter from a woman who said that she read my devotion and she didn't commit suicide because I convinced her that God loved her and that, you know, she was precious in his sight. And she said that I saved her life. And she said, oh, my gosh, Dr. Ensley, she said, the $20 I got for that devotion means nothing compared to this letter. And so that's exciting. That, who wouldn't want to do that? So, you know, I'm excited to help them get a good living, but also to help them change the world like that. And they get other letters. You know, people say, oh, I decided not to have an abortion because I read your testimony or your devotion. So for me, the joy of it is developing writers so that if I sat down and wrote all day long, I think I could turn out quite a bit of material. But if I spend time developing the 87 people I have in my program right now, they go out and they're all, you know, advancing the kingdom with what they write for devotions and testimonies and novels and articles and stage plays and everything, then it's just compounding the entire effect. So I feel like I'm making some little clones of myself to go out there and continue the work and, and keep it going. Well, that's absolutely incredible. And the last two questions, looking at where you are now, what would you tell your younger self? I would, um, I had several things, a piece of advice. First, I would say make sure that you know, don't become the Lone Ranger. Writing's a lonely business, and by having a mentor or a partner or a guide, you, you double your effort very, very quickly. When I was working on my doctoral dissertation and working at Ball State Teaching, I took a part-time job working at the Muncie Star newspaper, and it was terrific because they just didn't have time to be kind to me. We were on deadline, so they would grab whatever I wrote and they would red market and mark it up with a pen and all that and I would go make the changes and later when things calmed down and we got the paper out of going say hey explain to me again you know why this was a better lead down here and why you moved it up here and why you crossed up this and they'd say okay and they would explain things to me so I would tell people get into a writer's club or a online you know chat room or something where you can get your manuscript out there and have somebody critique it and give you feedback on that the other thing is networking is very important I told people I took eight of my students for example to the Right to Publish conference this year. And I said, you know, I want to put your face in front of editors and agents and people who are professional writers. Often people can send you work or provide work for you or they'll pay attention to what you're working on if you know them firsthand. So getting involved with writers at conferences and workshops and seminars and retreats, that would be a very, very important thing. A third thing that I would tell myself is don't stop being a student. Read the writing magazines, read books on writing, talk to other writers, because everything's crossover. Too many people think that I'm just going to write short stories, or I'm just going to write novels, and so they never study interviewing, they never study uh, journalism, they never study public relations writing. And here's the thing that you finally learn. Let's say if you're a journalist and you have to go out and you have to interview the chief of police or you have to interview a firefighter and you get to hear what that person's voice is like, then when you write fiction, you get it right because that's the way those people talk and you listen to yourself. Or you can go back and research that by interviewing people and put that in your fiction. So as you're learning nonfiction, you're enhancing your fiction. The same way with your nonfiction, you've got to be able to tell a narrative. You've got to be, be able to pull people in. So if you're not a good storyteller, people are going to say, well, I don't want just facts and statistics. That's boring. What I want is, you know, how does it hit me? Where do I live? And so there's a crossover. I call it cross-pollinization that one helps the other. So I would tell myself, learn, learn all you can, keep growing, never stop, keep reading books and magazines and talking to other writers. Great advice, and that piece of advice that you gave about kind of knowing how people talk, even if it's through interviews, you gave that at our writers' conference, and that's what kind of led me to contacting a captain in Charlotte, North Carolina, and 
it has helped immensely with how my characters should talk in my book. Good, good. Yeah, that field research, nothing can take the place of it. Definitely not. And the last question, if you could use only one sentence to profess your faith, what would you say? Um, I would say um, the, the one thing that I stress people is to go for closure. In other words, don't play at whatever you're doing. Let's say you're going to be a writer. Don't write one act of a play and put it down or write first draft of a poem and never finish it or just start a novel with three chapters and then give up on it or something like that. When your faith is strong and say, I believe I can do this, then stick with something until the end. Nobody ever came up to me and said, hey, aren't you the guy who wrote four chapters of a novel three years ago? Now what they say is, I read your novel and I enjoyed it. So for having faith in yourself and saying, okay, let me finish this project, project. let me put my name on it, let me send it out, I may have to do some more work on it, something to finish it, and then knowing that you've got faith in yourself as a writer, faith in the market, you know, the Lord's going to use that kind of work, and then faith that the readers want to take it in there, that's the kind of thing. So go for closure, don't play at it, don't fear rejection like, oh, I'll dabble at this, but go for closure, get it, and put it out there. That's great, and thank you so much for doing this interview with me today. I enjoyed it too. Talk to you again soon.